Okay, uh, welcome to our third Threat Intel series uh, and today's webinar. Uh, we're delighted to have Inspector Brian Halligan from the Garda National Cyber Crime Bureau who's going to be discussing law enforcement and threat intel. So for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, the Cyber Ireland Threat Intel Group uh, aims to build a, a community around threat intel and looks to improve the, the capabilities of that group through knowledge sharing and a series of webinars that we're running. So over the next year, we're going to have a, a monthly webinar uh, to take you from introductory topics in threat intel right up to more advanced topics. Uh, the first session that we held last year was around an introduction to threat intel and the MITRE attack 101. And the second session was on developing your threat intel strategy. Uh, all the webinars are deli de uh, delivered by our Threat Intel group members. So if you'd like to contribute to those sessions, uh, you can register your interest by sending us uh, an email afterwards. And um, today we have one of our Threat Intel group leads, Owen Carroll, who's going to be uh, hosting and moderating the session. Owen's on the Advanced Threat Research Team at McAfee, so I'll pass it over to him to kick off today. Thanks, Owen, and uh, welcome everybody today. Uh, just to give a little bit of background for people who may be um, coming to this series for the first time, we started this initiative last year, myself and Andy Grease from SmartTech24, uh, and the whole driver, as Owen mentioned, is really to, to foster and drive that collaboration of threat intelligence within Ireland. It's such an important uh, part of an overall defensible security architecture. And as part of that, we've already completed two um, sessions last year, and we have another a uh, number of sessions this year as well. So as part of the initiative, we're pulling in subject matter experts from different areas as identified from feedback we've had from all the uh, participants and members of this group, as well as the, the committee, and um, we're pulling those in as we need them. Um, so today I'm delighted that we, we have um, Inspector Brian Halligan from the Garda National Cyber uh, Crime Bureau. Uh, and Brian is going to talk about law enforcement and threat intelligence, and particularly from a cyber crime perspective and, and how you can engage with law enforcement. So. Thanks very much, Brian, for, for um, uh, attending today and um, let you take it away. Okay, thanks Owen for that introduction, just sharing my screen there. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Cyber Ireland for the opportunity to uh, address you here today. Um, as I say, Brian Halligan is my name, I'm Inspector in the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau. Um, I'm going to speak to you today, uh, introduce the Garda Cybercrime Bureau, um, what we're about, what our expansion plans are, etc, etc. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the threats we are seeing um, in, in the uh, cybercrime element, and particularly more so a focus on crime and the role of the Garda National Cybercrime Bureau and how we can work with you in the cybercrime industry to address those threats and how, how we can work together uh, to improve the safety, if you like, for all online users. Um, so just to talk about the Cybercrime Bureau, um, the Garden National Cybercrime Bureau, we are responsible for the prevention, detection, investigation, prosecution of cybercrime incidents in the state. Um, and cybercrime, as most of you know, generally involves incidents where the internet or information technology systems digital devices play a significant role in the commission of a criminal offence. So, um, you know, cybercrime is as broad as it is long. We're, we focus on areas from cyber-dependent to cyber-enabled crime um, and everything in between from all the various intelligence that goes with the cybercrime. Um, and we try and bring that together. Uh, what we have, and the cybercrime you are particularly interested in is um, attribution, who's behind the crime, you know, um, if there are people committing criminal offences out there in the cybercrime world, in, in, in the cyber environment, they are the people we are interested in, they are the people we want to uh, uh, get to, bring before the courts for, for uh, prosecutions, etc, etc. Um, the Cybercrime Bureau, where it fits in our own organisation, we sit under the Assistant Commissioner of Organising Serious Crime, along with some of the other national bureaus, including Joe's CAB, um, Protective services bureaus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think what is uh, very evident with our own bureau in recent times is uh, cybercrime has been flagged as a priority under the Commission of the Future of Policing in Ireland as a, an area for expansion from Garda Um And I am 
glad to report the organization, the Commission and the organization have ta are taking that very serious. And we have significant expansion plans in the moment to really build our capacity in, in the area of cybercrime. Um, plans are well advanced for the allocation of a large number of additional detectives to the Garda Cybercrime Bureau. And we are hoping they will be coming on board in the next uh, weeks, uh, possibly. Um, we are working on training our organization. We have 200, over 200 uh, cybercrime first responders tra trained in every guarded district throughout the country. Um, that was completed last year with the help of our academic partners, UCD. Um, we, continue, we propose to expand that this year and could train another 200 members in, in that field this year. We are setting up our satellite hubs. Um, we are setting up uh, cybercrime units around the country. And that's really about bringing the cybercrime services right down to a local level to, into the communities we serve and work with and bring those expertise in, in those areas and develop them as center, center of experts, center of, on top of our, our, our national center here in Dublin. Um, for further expansion plans in, in, include the, we hope to be going to hire a civilian forensic specialist in the coming weeks. We hope to have those jobs advertised very, very shortly as well. Um, so, we are building our capacity. We are, it's an exciting time for the Bureau and we are, we are certainly working with everybody involved and hoping to expand and work with you in the cybercrime industry in that regard as well. Um, the Bureau is led by Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Cleary. Um, first time there was a Detective Chief Superintendent appointed over the Cybercrime Bureau. So that is a, an indication of how serious the organization is, is taking it to. Um, the Texas Chief Super clearly brings a significant um, investigative experience to the role, having worked uh, ex extensively through uh, crime investigations right throughout his career. Uh, on top of that, we had a uh, Detective Superintendent Pat Ryan. Um, Pat Ryan brings a wealth of experience to the role as well, and is also a board member of the European Union Cybercrime Task Force as well. So we have a kind of expanded um, outreach in that regard as well. Areas of our areas of responsibility we cover um, cybercrime investigation. So that's really investigating any reported cybercrime. Um, and we have specialist trained detectives in that area working in how they can assist the public uh, in uh, cybercrime investigations. We have operational support. We provide a lot, a lot of support to our operational units at, throughout the organization. Um, computer forensic examination and analysis, a large portion of the work here in the Bureau is centered around uh, providing a computer forensic service throughout the Garda organization. So really what we're working is in all sorts of uh, crime investigation areas there from uh, sexual exploitation of children right down to uh, common um, everyday crimes where there are um, electronic devices seized or surrendered, where we, we would perform the uh, uh, forensic analysis on those devices. Cyber threat intelligence, we have a threat intelligence office where we um, record, monitor, log, um, and build a threat intel of what's happening out there in the cybercrime realm in general. Um, and try and we try and bring that to a, another level and work towards attribution in that regard. Cybersecurity, we work with uh, our industry partners, uh, NCSC, um, on looking at a cybersecurity issue in general, in general and threats to national infrastructure, et cetera. We have a role in that, in that area as well. Cyber safety, as a lot of it is about prevention and awareness. We run cyber safety campaigns. We run one for Cyber Safety Month last year. We have another one being prepared at the moment for Internet Safety Day in October. And so that's about engaging with the public um, and informing, etc. International liaison, a big part of cybercrime, of course, is international liaison, because as we know, there are no borders in cybercrime. So we would liaise extensively with other law enforcement partners, PSNI, UK law enforcement partners, um, but extensively as well with uh, Interpol and Europol. Um, and we work a lot with the European uh, Cybercrime Centre in um, The Hague as well. So we, we, we work a lot, a lot, do a lot of inter international liaison and we build on that. Um, and then academic and industry liaison. So we understand that uh, cybercrime, we need to work closely with industry, uh, with cybersecurity experts, cybersecurity industry, and our academic as well. Um, we rely heavily on our academic partners for their research and training in that field as well. So it's quite a broad area as well. So. They're just uh, some of the areas which we cover in the Bureau. Um, what I really want to talk to you about today is our threats, cybercrime threats, as we, as we see them and as we are experiencing them. Um, and I guess when we talk about threats in, in the crime element, we look at, well, what does, it, what does it involve? Well, cybercrime, as with any crime, 
there are three central components. There's a victim, a motive, and an opportunity. Um, the victim is a target, you, I, um, your company, your industry, etc. Uh, the motive can vary. Um, it's what drives the criminal. It can be revenge, it can be coercion, um, state, uh, espionage. But centrally, what we're seeing, the main motive is financial, financial gain. So the criminals are motivated by money, by greed, and they're looking to uh, um, extort that out of their victims in any guise that they can do it. Um, and the third component then is opportunity. So that's where the criminals really exploit the vulnerabilities, um, let it be technical, let it be human through social engineering, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they are really, really focusing on the opportunity. So if we, if we think about it in that sense, um, the victims are always going to be present. The motive is always going to be present. People want to make money um, through illegal means. Um, so what we need, really need to focus on is the opportunity. Um, and I would say to you, and I, and I know you'll be familiar with this, in the, in the cybersecurity industry is um, it's really about reducing the vulnerabilities to deny that opportunity. That's what, 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 uh, what a, lot, um, a lot of the focus is about uh, in the cybersecurity realm. So I guess when we're thinking of threats, where are we at the moment? And I just to, to put some focus on it, um, I look at the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, um, the most obvious one of a lot, and how that has changed the threat landscape out there from a cyber crime perspective. So what we are seeing is uh, criminals are innovative, opportunistic, and, and they're exploiting people's fears, concerns, vulnerabilities as a result of the pandemic. Uh, criminals are tweaking existing forms of cyber crime to fit the pandemic narrative. Uh, so really what we're seeing is we're seeing the same traditional types of cyber crime, but we're seeing them, if you like, in a COVID cloak. They're using a COVID team to um, exploit people's vulnerabilities in order for them to uh, commit a crime or, or, or um, re really most of those, it's, it's a financial gain. So it's a, all or a lot of phishing attacks, social media campaigns, et cetera, et cetera, are focused on a, a COVID team because they know that is a narrative which is uh, worldwide at the moment. We're all in the same boat uh, right throughout the world. So the same narrative fits in any country in the globe. So it's easy for them to package that. Um, uh, and they are doing that to uh, some good effect. So a lot of it is, is known scams with a, with a COVID team attached to them. So on that, I, I guess I'm just gonna quickly step through some of the um, COVID team attacks we are seeing uh, and the timelines for those attacks. And it's interesting to note that the timeline for the attacks generally follows the COVID uh, timeline um, if we look at the, initially there was a lack of information. So if we go back to about January, 2020, but this time last year, there was a lot of uh, talk of uh, COVID um, spreading throughout the globe. It, um, it was in China, not reported yet in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. People knew this was coming. So people were um, anxious, fearful, and there was a lack of information out there. People were going on various websites, uh, social media channels, et cetera, clicking on links. Um, what we were seeing was uh, fake websites being set up, fake phishing emails being sent out through various channels, um, smishing, et cetera, et cetera, purporting to be from agencies such as the World Health Organization or a reputable agency bringing you to a website, either looking for information or a compromised website where they're installing uh, certain malwares, et cetera, et cetera, on your system. From there, we moved on to what we're looking at, um, seeing instances of uh, fraud in the sale of goods. So you will recall um, when the pandemic came in first, there was a worldwide shortage of, of a PPE equipment, for example, and uh, cyber criminals were very um, targeted in that, that there were online sites selling PPE, advertising those sites, um, only to sell either fake or non-existent PPE at all. So really what they were doing was scamming people out of their money. And there was a lot of um, quite large, <coughs> quite um, heavily publicized uh, investigations into fake PPE sales uh, in, in this country as well. So from there, we've seen um, support schemes being targeted. So government agencies and payments. So we've seen things like uh, phishing emails, smishing um, text messages, et cetera, around things like the pandemic unemployment payment, um, payment click on the link to register, uh, bringing you into taking your financial details, taking your bank details, similarly offering tax rebate, bringing you to fake websites which 
period very, extremely legit, appearing to be from the revenue commission, commissioners, offering uh, tax rebate schemes for businesses, for self-employed people, uh, tax back schemes. Um, and people were clicking on those links and, uh, and they were extorting that information and extorting your bank account details only for them then to transfer funds out of your bank account and into your bank account. So, so uh, from there, we see a lot of um, cures, drugs, treatments for sale on, online. Um, and as we know, they didn't exist at the time. There was no special drugs, there was none of that. But that doesn't really stop criminals exploiting people's fears in that concern and uh, building on conspiracy theories, etc., etc. We've seen uh, charity donations. Um, most of us really recall that a lot of the charities around the country, their fundraising efforts were hardly, were, were badly hit due to the pandemic and uh, the lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. And we're making appeals for charity donations. Um, we've seen a lot of fake charity websites, fake uh, being sent out through various phishing emails through social media channels. Um, and what are we doing with people is, um, stealing your funds as well. So again, very simple, but what they were proving very, very effective for the cyber criminals. Um, from there, then we see coming into the summertime, airlines, holiday refunds, again, bringing it to fake websites, getting your bank details, offering your refund of your holidays from your various um, airlines, etc. Only again, to get your bank details, to get um, and uh, transfer funds out of your accounts, etc. Online shopping around Christmas time proved quite big. Um, most people refer to online shopping particular, more so in the pandemic than ever before. So people were buying their Christmas presents, doing their Christmas shopping from possibly the end of September, October, November, doing Christmas shopping. Um, cyber criminals exploited that as well, sending out emails saying your, there's been a, your, shop, your order has been cancelled. Uh, please click here for a refund. Uh, enter your details, we'll send you a refund, etc., etc. Um, and another quite a uh, one as well, not re directly related to technology, but um, nonetheless it was happening. We've seen uh, loneliness in lockdown. Uh, people were moving to various online forms, uh, dating websites, dating, dating apps, etc. Um, because they were experiencing lockdown, they were, their social network was being denied to them due to the pandemic restrictions, spending more time online. What we've seen is a, is a spike in instances of romance fraud and investment fraud. People were bringing them to uh, fake profiles and quite a extensive grooming process uh, over protracted periods of time where somebody gains somebody's trust. Um, and then they are looking for funds either directly or give, providing opportunities for investment. Um, and we have, we have ongoing investigations in that regard too. And there are some very, very um, large figure frauds have been created, up to six figure frauds created in that realm. So it's something that's worth mentioning uh, and, and, and worth being, being aware of. Um, where we are very much at the moment seeing issues is on the vaccines. Um, as we know, the vaccine is being rolled out at the moment. Um, so we are seeing sites purporting to sell the vaccine, uh, uh, even purchase the vaccine, go to this. The vaccine isn't publicly available and can't be purchased. Uh, but likewise, uh, submission emails purporting to be from the uh, and text messages etc. purporting to be from the HSE, for example, asking people to register for the vaccine. Um, please register and we'll send you the details. Um, and they are stealing people's information on your accreditation and in some cases as well, looking for their bank details to verify their identity, etc. So it's um, and you know, they're targeting a certain cohort as well. We might see that well, the HSE would never look for your financial details and they don't and they never will, and they are advertisement campaigns to that effect. But I guess not everybody is as tech savvy possibly as ourselves. Um, so you can imagine some of the uh, more vulnerable people in society, older people, etc., are receiving those, those and are worried and concerned and they're clicking on them and, they're, and they're, um, their credentials are being stolen as a result. One I mentioned which is very topical is homeschooling. Um, I'm sure many of you are probably even at home as we speak listening to this webinar, um, kids in the background doing homework, doing homeschooling, etc., and the distractions associated with that. Uh, um, like, and various scam messages being sent in, people getting, um, for example, one scam that went around early in the year was uh, your Netflix account is about to expire, please log on to renew your account in the middle of uh, the day, knowing that people are probably uh, trying to get work done from home, they may have the kids um, on Netflix possibly while they're working, 
and, and uh, so just even the timing of it in that regard. Uh, other ones then is we would advise um, a lot of the teachers, moderators, those controlling the homeschooling environment to familiarize yourself with the safety measures. Um, use things like the waiting room, lock the classroom once people come in. Uh, we have seen instances of uninvited guests into the classroom um, talking inappropriately in front of uh, children, uh, um, inappropriate images, messages, etc. And you know, like our children are the most vulnerable in society, so it is important that we get that right, and it's important to uh, mention it as well. Other areas then we see, um, and thankfully we haven't been hit badly here, but we, we do know what is happening out there is um, attacks on uh, national infrastructure such as healthcare services, um, cyber criminals are targeting those because they know the pressure they're under, they know um, the potential obviously that those services have to remain open, remain active at the moment. Um, so you can imagine the, uh, the uh, anxiety around that. So like in the middle of a pand pandemic, criminals don't have any scrutiny. They're not worried about uh, what, what harm to cause. We did even see incidents of some of the um, cyber crime groups uh, or the advanced uh, persistent threat actors even coming out with comments saying that they're not going to target um, healthcare services during the pandemic. However, we still see healthcare services targeted and there have been a number of hospitals targeted around Europe in that regard as well. Um, I guess uh, moving on, I said the one I want to draw particular attention to is uh, working from home. Um, and we see the uh, associated risks that comes with that as well. And I'll single out that for particular uh, attention. It's, um, I guess what, what the, people are working from home, they're associated with time constraints, there's susceptible uh, to be deceived because of everything else is going on in the background of the house is full of kids in the background. Um, and really there's an increased likelihood to fall victim of cyber crime as a result. And that's creating opportunities for the cyber criminals. Um, what we see when we look at work from home, we've seen a mass rollout of work from home arrangements. Um, ensure, and it was all to do with ensuring business continuity, relaxation of security measures. Uh, as a result, that all creates opportunities for cyber criminals. Um, and the two key areas there where we would see issues is uh, the use of personal devices to access corporate environments. So people are using their, their um, tablets, phones, personal laptops, etc., to access their corporate environment. They, they may not have the strict uh, cybersecurity policies enforced on them, and, um, and that is creating vulnerabilities in that regard as well. So a lot of what we're seeing is, as a result, um, people or cyber criminals are using the personal device as a gateway or an access point into the corporate environment, and we're seeing data compromise. But uh, most, most, most importantly, the big one we're seeing there is ransomware and the uptake in ransomware as a result. Um, I guess what's ransomware, you know, it's, it's uh, the criminals that are after encrypt your data, deny you access to your data, uh, threaten to publish it online. And we're seeing instances now where they're also threatening to uh, auction it off as well. If you don't pay the ransom, you don't get back your data. You don't, um, and we have your data as well. And we're prepared to monetize it as well. So that is um, one of the biggest uptakes we're seeing out there at the moment. Um, and we, you know, we advise anyone operating in that, re in that effect really to, um, companies to review their cybersecurity policies, particularly on, uh, on their home devices. Our advice from ransomware is not to pay, uh, report the incident to, to ourselves here in the guards um, and invoke an incident response plan. If you don't have an incident response plan, we would advise you to get um, focus on that and get that up and running at the moment. Um, as regards what we will work at, on a report of a cybercrime incidents, um, you know, we will, the Garden National Cybercrime Bureau, we have trained uh, detectives in the area of uh, cybercrime who have extensive knowledge in the ransomware element. And we will work with you to try and uh, assist you, provide us uh, help, work to get your data back, um, and uh, if at all possible, try and identify who's behind the attack. We, we uh, would work closely with Europol, European Cybercrime Centre, um, and they have an advanced um, malware analysis service who, where we have direct access to as well. Um, and if it's a case where you don't have your data backed up, there is a service there which we would um, encourage you to uh, have a look at as well. And that's the No More Ransom. That's a public-private partnership uh, control under Europol where we would um, we have uh, about 150, uh, I think, known ransomwares 
uh, that they can deal with there and, and provide the, uh, the encryption keys, etc. So we will work with you in that regard. Um, and we advise you not to pay. Uh, problem is if you're paying, there's no guarantee you'll get your, your data back. Uh, you're then listed as a company who is willing to engage with the criminals. Um, they sell that information online and you will most certainly become a target at the game for the future, etc. Brian, just sorry to cut across you. Uh, four minutes left, just so you're aware. Yep. Thanks, Owen. Yep, so that's a good time actually, just coming to the conclusion of it. Um, I guess, look at worldwide efforts um, from governments, industry, etc., in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, been focused on the public health and rightly so. Um, that's the number one issue concerning everyone. But I guess it, it is important to know that there is secondary effects. And the, um, as, a, as a senator, secondary effect is a threat to our technology and rich society. So where we've indiscriminate uh, and targeted cyber attacks and cyber, cyber campaigns. And that is uh, most certainly has increased during the COVID and is a secondary of, of the pandemic itse itself. So what I would like to say to you from a uh, Garden National Cybercrime Bureau is, look, um, we are here to work with you. We are more than willing to engage with you. We are building our capacity in the uh, realm of cybercrime. Uh, we are ex expanding both our knowledge and outreach. Um, we're reaching out to you industry experts, cybersecurity experts. We understand that um, cybercrime um, cyber safety, cyber security is a shared responsibility uh, between all, the, all people who use the um, internet. Um, we want to work with you, work with the cyber crime industry. Um, my appeal today to you today is if you have an incident, if you are experiencing issues, come and talk to us and we will, and work, we will work with you. And you know, we understand um, the issues around uh, business continuity, you need to keep your business. Do you understand the issues around confidentiality, that uh, the reputational damages and everything that goes with it? Like on a report for cyber crime incident, we're not going to suddenly land in with blue lights flashing, season all servers, etc. We understand that's not the way this type of crime works. So we're willing to work with you in that regard. Um, you can, if you have an incident to report, um, immediate uh, response from a guard you're going to hazard any crime with your local guard station. However, the Cybercrime Bureau are also willing to work with you um, and you can reach out uh, and contact ourselves as well. Um, we will talk to you. And um, I guess from an intelligence perspective as well, I know this series is focused on threat intel. Um, a lot of what we work towards is attribution as well, see who's behind the cybercrime. And a lot of that comes from the intelligence that we can get from you and the intelligence associated with the various different cyber attacks, the cyber vector, the attack vectors, etc. We do link in closely with other law enforcement agencies, with Europol and Interpol, to help build up that intelligence. Um, so even if we cannot get a, a direct um, attribution from the information you give us, that narrative, that AMO could lead um, greatly to the assistance of, uh, of the bigger picture and getting who's behind the, uh, the very cyber crime. And that's, a, that's an area where we are very much reliant on the industry to work with us in that regard. Um, uh, so on, on that, I'll hand it back to yourself, Owen, um, if there are any uh, questions, I'm gladly uh, assist or help with you. Thanks, uh, Brian, that was excellent. And uh, we don't have any questions right now, um, but you know, maybe some more will come in in the next couple of minutes. We can run over for a couple of minutes if, if people are happy to stay on the line. So, so Brian, I think that was a really, really great presentation and overview. And, and, and I think it's great. I mean, you're, you're so on top of the threat landscape and, and uh, you know, explain how the criminals always pivot to you know, what's going on in the world and, and what's the hot topic right now with COVID. Sometimes it's celebrities or whatever the case may be, but that, that's where they, they kind of pivot to. And um, maybe just explain a little bit more, like how, how can maybe enterprises, you know, engage with, with the law enforcement? I think it's great you're there to support. Just maybe explain, if you could expand that one maybe a little bit more. Yeah, look, um, if you need our um, uh, urgent assistance straight away to a crime, we would say uh, contact your local guard station or um, incidents are dealt with straight away. They have an escalation procedure then and they can come through ourselves. But if you just want to um, engage with us in general terms um, in relation to uh, intelligence, etc., you can reach out to us, um, our email address, uh, gnccb, Garda National Cybercrime Bureau, um, at Garda.ie. So gnccb at Garda.ie was an email which will come directly into our office here. Um, 
And you can also, I would encourage use of this form, the Cyber Ireland form. We are a member of a Cyber Ireland as well. Um, Owen and his team there are uh, very helpful. So don't be afraid to reach out uh, to those forms um, and come in and talk to us, engage with us. We're more than willing to uh, to help. So really, emergency response straight into your to your um, guard station. But then uh, other issues, just uh, contact us here in the bureau as well. Great, thanks, uh, Brian. I think the great thing you touched on there as well was was the fact that um, you mentioned about you know remote working from home and people uh, using schooling software, etc and unmanaged machines potentially. Uh, you know, I think that's something I've seen in the past as well. So I think that's a really, really good one to reinforce as well what you're saying there that, you know, for companies to understand where their assets are, you know, how attackers can, the vectors or how they can pivot to, to get to those assets. And, you know, if you're using unmanaged machines or what, however you're, you know, people are connecting, I think it's very, very important point you made there that people really understand, you know, what machines are connecting back into their network and what, what they have access to and stuff like that, because, with a ransomware attack, as you, as you mentioned there, you know, if, if they can get in, they can spread very, very quickly and, and there's dire consequences for that. Yeah, look, it's, um, I think the reality is with COVID, a lot, COVID caught a lot of us by surprise, um, or we definitely weren't ready uh, globally for the effects of COVID for um, everybody all of a sudden working from home, et cetera. So the reality is uh, in order to maintain continuity of business, people did use unsecured devices. Um, companies accepted that risk. Uh, but what we would appeal now is review that. Uh, now we need to find more time. Review what devices, what security measures, what patching, uh, what software updates. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, like for a crime to occur, the victim is omnipresent. That's, that's all, everybody. Um, the motive is omnipresent, and that's nearly always financial gain. So the one area you work with is that the opportunity. So where we can limit the opportunity, um, we should really focus on that in the cybercrime industry. I know they do. Uh, so how do you deny those opportunities to the cyber criminals? Um, and they really need to be a strong area of focus. And obviously, um, on, on secure devices is, is a big opportunity. Um, and then, you know, the, the opportunities associated with uh, the emotional vulnerabilities of people as well. So um, look, the reality is, if something generally, if you're trying to, you see, we all see various um, scams online. If something is too good to be true, it is, you know, the reality is it, 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 um, it is too good to be true. So we just ask people to stop and think, you know, don't panic into clicking links too quick. Um, reputable companies will never ask you for financial details. They'll never ask you to verify account details. Um, we are seeing increased level of submission campaigns from the, from the financial institutions, the banks, et cetera. Um, you know, we would um, and quite uh, uh, quite convincing. You know, the websites to bring you to are, are, are look quite convincing and look very real. But um, we ask you to pay heed to the warnings there and uh, not to engage. Um, and at all, at every level, we ask people not to engage in, cyber, in with the cyber criminals because once you engage, um, they have you under hook. Apologies, an unplanned interruption there. So sorry, Brian, one, one last thing, a good question came in there about the NCSC and just critical infrastructure and stuff. So you you, you do work, the Garda um, Cyber Crime Bureau are working closely with the NCSC. Yes, we do work very closely with the NCSC. We have a number of Garda members on full-time just comment to the NCSC. We will be a member on full-time just comment in the very near future from the Garda National Cyber Crime Bureau. So we do work closely with the team there. Um, we share a lot of our threat intel as well. Um, we see what's happening out there. Um, they have their, their own extended network through the um, European, uh, their European networks as well. So that's an area we do work closely um, when there is close collaboration and uh, joined up thinking in that regard as well. Um, and we have some uh, joint campaigns as well around cyber, uh, so cyber security and cyber awareness with the NCC as well in that regard. So that's an area we are, we are constantly working with them uh, closely with and with other government departments as well, with other um, agencies uh, in the Department of Justice, et cetera, et cetera. Right, now that's great, Brian. And I think the great thing as well is it looks like you, you guys have, you really have a solid base to kind of build on. There's a strong strategy there and it looks like, you know, you're going to be um, 
over the next couple of years building that up a lot, right? With, with engaging with Europol and all the, the other agencies in Europe. Yes, look, um, I went through our expansion our plans there. Um, it is great to see that the organization is really serious on, on cybercrime. Um, and we are really, really open our game in that regard. We are expanding our personnel or, and we are expanding our capacity, our capabilities in there. We engage a lot and work very, very closely with our other law enforcement partners and, and most particularly to Europol, to the European Cybercrime Centre. We have a number of uh, members of this bureau on full time to comment working as uh, national experts in Europol as well in the Cybercrime Centre. So they are providing great assistance in that regard. Um, and you know, they have a, a very strong outreach as well to other law enforcement agencies and expertise in the area. So like when you're coming to the Garden of the Cybercrime Bureau reporting an issue, yes, we have highly skilled uh, cybercrime investigators um, and digital forensic investigators working here, but we also have uh, access to that network of expansion um, in the greater law enforcement community. Um, so we, we do rely on those and we, we do work very, very closely with them, with other law enforcement partners, as we said, the NCSC. And it's really all about bring, creating a, a safer online environment for all. And we're, very, we're also very eager then at this point to work very, very cl more closely with our cybersecurity industry. So any of the people working within the industry, we are happily and very eager to work with you to build those relationships um, to, in order to create a safer environment. And uh, we're particularly interested in attribution as well. Anything that you can help us with in identifying cyber threat actors we're very, very interested in listening to that and, and hearing you in, in that regard. Yeah, that's great. That's great to know, Brian. So I think the key message here really is that, you know, people to reach out to the National um, Cyber Crime Bureau and um, you know, you're there to support enter enterprise enterprises. And it's a, it's a kind of a bi-directional thing as well, right? I think because you, you, do, you do kind of um, need the support from enterprises as well and threat intelligence teams, et cetera, can kind of help you get more context on what's happening. And um, and so, like from a, a threat to na national infrastructure perspective, is that more in the remit of the NCSC, or is it something you kind of collaborate on? No, we collaborate quite closely with that and the NCSC as well. Work with our uh, national intelligence service as well. Um, so, with two sides of it, we, we the Cybercrime Bureau really focuses a lot on our on the crime element of it, and then our um, our security side of the house focus work closely with the NCSC. On the national infrastructure side as well, but we do work collaboratively across all across all areas as well. So um, we would be interested in um, any intelligence, any information, uh, any of the uh, industry experts have on any threats to the national infrastructure as well, because ultimately there is a crime behind the two. Um, there are anything anything where people are breaking the law involves a crime and we are interested in that as well and we work closely with with our the um, security intelligence side of and guard ship on it and uh, the ncsc as well so there's a lot of joined up thinking um in in that regard as well yeah i think there was a question on it as well which we may not answer but any any kind of threat that we know of right now is cr national critical infrastructure so we probably might not mightn't go there on that one just yet but i just want to say you know thank you for, to everybody for calling in I know we went, ran over a little bit here with this, but I think it was it was well worth it because I think great insight for, um, on this call here and uh, from Brian, and really really appreciate you coming in. And I think I think it's great to know. I think we're, we're we're gradually kind of fostering this community and building this expertise up. And uh, would also like to say to everybody on the call here, if you do want to contribute to this, please reach out to us. And um, we we have a subcommittee within Cyber Ireland for threat intelligence uh, run by myself and Andy and uh, more than welcome to have more people come on board. So thanks to everybody for joining. Thanks to Brian and um, apologies for running over, but I think it was well worth it. Thank you. And thank everyone and the team in Cyber Ireland for the opportunity to speak today. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thanks very much Owen and, and Brian. Um, I think really interesting presentation. So we're going to send out the, the slide deck afterwards and we'll have a link to the, the recording. We'll put that up on our YouTube channel and we'll also have the GNCC the email address, uh, I'll include that as well. Look, I think overall, Brian, it's a really positive development um, that the GNCCB is undergoing a very large expansion from you know, the 200 people that have been trained up in cybercrime first respondents 
and the internal recruitment to the tech detectives and external recruitment that's going on as well. Um, interesting, you know, that you were saying about, uh, I suppose, the impact maybe to the healthcare services um, from cyber attacks, not in Ireland, but in other European countries. And Cyber Ireland, the National Cyber Security Centre, uh, actually addressed this partly last year. We put out a call for volunteers from the cyber security community that would be able to respond in a serious cyber security incident in a healthcare setting. And we got a really good um, uh, number of people that signed up to that right across the country. And that uh, we opened that up again in, in October for, for a second call as well. Um, I suppose looking to, to the next Threat Intel webinar uh, that we have coming up in February, that's going to be on an introduction to threat intelligence platforms and consumption. And we also have a, a full roadmap of webinars planned out for the year, as Owen was saying. And um, some really great presentations are coming up from uh, people in CrowdStrike, FireEye, and a number of other companies as well. So to stay up to date uh, on the Tread Intel webinars, we'll be posting that out, out to our mailing list. There's a specific mailing list for the Tread Intel group. So if you register when you're registering for, for this webinar, you had a chance to tick the box on that. Uh, and as Owen said, there's always opportunities to sign up and get involved with the Tread Intel group, but also across the whole of, of Cyber Ireland as well. We have a number of different working groups and, and subcommittees. And um, so what we'll do is we'll send out a, the call for volunteers. If you'd be interested in contributing to your regional chapter and um, maybe, you know, getting involved in the SME or the Startup Committee, uh, there's Cyber Women Ireland group as well. Uh, and we have a call for, for speakers for events and chapter meetings as well. So we'll include that. Uh, in the email as well. So thanks very much for joining us today. We'll leave it there.